like 5000 likes to this video, we will implode more patriotic news. Thank you. NBC just sided with Kim Jong Un over President Trump. We not only have a lying, fake news media, they are also vindictive and outright dangerous. President Trump stood up for the American people by telling the chubby North Korean dictator that if he threatens America, he will deal with fire and fury, the likes of which the world has never seen. As many predicted, the lunatic dictator fired back at President Trump, upping the ante by claiming he'd attack Guam. The man is crazy and unstable, does this come as a shock to anyone? Well, apparently it's a shock to CNBC, who prefers the feckless Obama approach. So much so, they slammed President Trump and in doing so, took the side of North Korea's cruel and evil dictator. That's how awful our media is. Did you stand with President Trump against Kim Jong-un? What do you think about this comment below? North Korea released a Canadian pastor and still holds three American citizens. As US and North Korea are having a combative relationship, North Korea just released a Canadian priest who is in their prison since 2015. Hi Eon Sulim, 62-year pastor was sentenced to lifetime in prison for attempting to take down Korean government, charges that the Canadian officials denied. Lim was released two months after an American student Otto Warmbier died in North Korea, after serving approximately a year in prison because he stole a propaganda poster. Lim came back with serious health problems, and he had a dramatic weight loss, stated Lisa Pack a family spokesperson. We are relieved to hear that Reverend Lim is on his way home to finally reunite with his family and meet his granddaughter for the first time, Pak stated. There is a long way to go in terms of Reverend Lim's healing. Therefore, in the meantime, we ask the media for privacy as he reconnects with his loved ones and receives medical attention. As James Lim, the pastor's son stated, he was informed that Canadian officials delivering a letter to Kim Jong-un just departed for North Korea to secure Lim's release. In February 2015 Lim was arrested during a humanitarian mission. He was representative of the Light Korean Presbyterian Church, which he had led since 1986. As his family stated, Lim visited North Korea at least 100 times before he was arrested. North Korea has many other foreigners detained among which are three Americans that we know of. Businessman Kim dong Chul, imprisoned in October 2015, who was sentenced to a 10-year in prison for espionage. Two other American citizens are detained, for hostile acts against the government. Kim sang duk an academic also called Tony Kim, was imprisoned in April. Researcher Kim hak Song was imprisoned in May. Please share this post on Facebook with your thoughts. What is your opinion on this? Scroll down to comment below. Thray Gowdy calls out scientists who withheld cancer triggering research data. Thray Gowdy has been asking questions whether the National Cancer Institute swept proof under the rug in regards to a potential cure, a herbicide, which allegedly cures cancer. Gowdy sent a letter on Tuesday to the NCI asking the details of their research. The letter was intended for scientist Aaron Blair, who first broke the news of the potentially healing herb. The committee is concerned about these new revelations, especially given Dr. Blair's apparent admission that the AHS study was powerful, and would alter Yark's analysis of glyphosate, Gowdy wrote. This came right after the International Agency for Research on Cancer, EARC stated that the herb might actually cause cancer instead of treating it back in 2015. Gowdy further asked for an in-depth proof that justified Blair's decision to conduct an individual study from the one carried out by EARC. This development affected Monsanto, an agribusiness that grows the Roundup weed that is packed with glyphosate. Monsanto is doing its best to keep people from understanding that glyphosate is, in fact, a cancer-triggering substance. In March, the European Chemical Agency, ICA, ruled that the available scientific evidence did not meet the criteria to classify glyphosate as a carcinogen. Aside from Gowdy, other Republicans also raised suspicion on the study, including Senator Jim Inhofe of Oklahoma, 
who asked the Department of Health and Human Services to publicly admit and prove that glyphosate doesn't cause cancer. Blair has been blamed of mishandling relevant information regarding the study, alongside investigators at Duke University who were also accused of tampering with related data. Potscan stated the fake data was being included in various publications and grant applications. Former analyst Joseph Thomas noted that the university didn't pay attention to Potscan's research, although the signs were more than obvious. She collaborated with Michael Foster, to whom the Environmental Protection Agency gave a grant in 2007. The grant was supposed to serve to find if subjection to airborne particulates can cause lung cancer in man who advised Michelle Obama on inedible school lunches arrested for defrauding lunch program. Los Angeles, California, David Binkle is a chef and one of the architects behind Michelle Obama's inedible lunches. He was recently arrested for defrauding the school lunch program and is facing up to 13 years in prison if convicted. LA Times reports, David Binkle was hailed as a pioneer among school nutrition advocates for accomplishing a near-Herculean task using produce and meats provided by local growers to greatly reduce the number of fatty meals served in the nation's second-largest school district. The initiatives won the district numerous awards, drew praise from then-First Lady Michelle Obama as she led a national push to combat childhood obesity, and earned Binkle appearances on TEDx Talks. The 55-year-old appeared in court on Tuesday and pleaded not guilty to 15 felony counts including embezzlement and misappropriation of public funds. He posted $220,000 bail and is scheduled to return to court in October. While recognizing that everyone is innocent until proven guilty, the charges against Mr. Binkle are extremely upsetting as they do not reflect the professionalism, ethics and character we expect of all LA Unified employees the school district said in a statement. According to court documents, Binkle repeatedly misappropriated district funds in amounts ranging from $5,000 to $15,000 between 2010 and 2014. Prosecutors also allege that he forged an application to become a vendor with the district and failed to disclose outside financial interests. If convicted, he faces up to 13 years in prison. Interestingly, George Beck a former food services deputy branch director responsible for accounting and budgets, previously told The Times he began questioning Binkle's management of the marketing program as early as 2011. Beck says he was laid off in retaliation two years later while no action was taken against Binkle. Is anyone connected to the Obamas not a criminal? Michelle Obama's disgusting lunch program is a thing of the past. The children don't miss these plates of slop. Good riddance to the chef and to Michelle Obama's legacy. Eric Bowling files lawsuit against Huffington Post contributor who released sexual harassment story. Last Friday, news of Fox News host Eric Bowling's suspension from the network stirred things up, as he was accused of sending photos of his private parts to his female colleagues. Since then, Bowling decided not to become the next Bill O'Reilly and spoke up immediately, promising to defend his honor and image to the best of his abilities. The report was released Yash Raleigh, a contributor to HuffPost, who has become a thorn in Bowling's eye shortly after. Bowling's attorney, Michael J. Bow, released a prompt statement in regards to the false claims, Mr. Bowling recalls no such inappropriate communications, does not believe he sent any such communications and will vigorously pursue his legal remedies for any false and defamatory accusations that are made. Then, Bowling himself posted on Twitter, as far as the story goes, Bowling just dropped a lawsuit against the reporter, worth $50 million. Billing is demanding to be paid a pretty sweet sum of $50 million as a compensation for suffering humiliation once the story broke. Afterwards, Yashrali responded to Bowling's demand via a very peculiar tweet, Bowling is represented in the case by the same law firm that is taking care of President Trump's legal affairs, which is Gasol and Spencer Torres LLP. The firm is also handling cases of numerous other celebrities. The lawsuit's specifics are listed in the image below, buckle up, folks, this is about to get turbulent. 
New emails show Comey and Lynch collusion over tarmac meeting. More information is coming out about the meeting former Attorney General Loretta Lynch had with Bill Clinton last summer, indicating that her top lawyers at the Justice Department edited press statements concerning the event in question. The Washington Free Beacon is reporting, the same attorney, Paige Herwig, is now the Deputy General Counsel for Democrats on the Senate Judiciary Committee. That panel is now investigating whether Lynch played any role in trying to influence the scope or intensity of the FBI's investigation into the Hillary Clinton email scandal. Prior to her legal work with Lynch at Justice, Herwig was a special assistant and associate counsel to President Obama. Newly released Justice Department emails show that Herwig, whose title was counselor to the Attorney General at the time, helped edit the first media statement responding to inquiries about the tarmac meeting. Those emails were included in 413 pages of Justice Department documents the American Center for Law and Justice, ACLJ, obtained through a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit. The emails show that on June 29, 2016, two days after the Clinton lunch meeting when the national news media was first learning of the tarmac one-on-one, -on -one, Melanie Newman, that the Director of Public Affairs at the Justice Department, emailed her FBI counterpart to flag the media stories about the tarmac meeting that she noted were gaining traction tonight. Newman included a transcript of a question Lynch answered about the meeting the following day, as well as Justice Department talking points on the topic, which are redacted in the emails. The meeting between Clinton and Lynch occurred right after the conclusion of the FBI investigation into the email scandal that played a significant role in Hillary's loss to Donald Trump in last year's election. What makes this meeting look so shady is that Lynch was the individual who would determine whether or not to pursue criminal action against Clinton for her email debacle, and after this little rendezvous, she decided to go ahead and accept the FBI recommendation. Four days passed and former FBI Director James Comey held a press conference where he more or less said Hillary was off the hook and cleared from indictment. Comey has stated that the meeting between Clinton and Lynch was a deciding factor in coming out and stating that while Hillary was extremely careless, she hadn't done anything criminal. Seems pretty clear that Hillary got away with this whole email thing without even a slap on the wrist, which does massive damage to our nation. We're supposed to be a nation of laws, a country where every single individual is equal under the law, no favorites or special classes of people. Hopefully, one day, Hillary will be held accountable for her many illegal activities. That day may be soon, as today we reported Trump's Justice Department may be offering her a plea bargain. GOP Senator suggests John McCain's brain tumor affected his health care vote. Last month, Arizona Senator John McCain shot down the Obamacare repeal bill, effectively betraying the entire Republican Party. On Tuesday, McCain was humiliated when Senator Ron Johnson, R. We, suggested in a radio interview that he only cast this vote because his brain cancer affected his ability to look at things logically. I'm not going to speak for John McCain. He has a brain tumor right now, that vote occurred at 1.30 in the morning, some of that might have factored in, Johnson said, according to Independent Journal Review. The stunt host then asked Johnson if he thought that the tumor was a factor in McCain voting no on the bill, at which time he tried to backtrack. Again, I, I, I don't know exactly what, we really thought, and again I don't want speak for any senator, Johnson responded. I really thought John was going to vote yes to send that to conference at 10.30 at night. By about 1 o'clock, 1.30, he voted no. So you have to talk to John in terms what was on his mind. It's already known that Democrats were in contact with McCain before the vote, so they likely influenced him. Conservative Tribune reported that McCain received a call from former Vice President and Delaware Senator Joe Biden before the health care vote took place. This has led people to speculate that Barack Obama's second-in-command influenced the Arizona senator to turn on his party. In addition, McCain took a call from Democrat Julie Berman, the Connecticut moderate who stood as Al Gore's running mate in the 2000 presidential election. Ed O'Keefe and Paul Kane wrote in the Washington Post that, Biden, the former vice president who often clashed in a collegial way with McCain on foreign policy matters, 
had a more emotional discussion with McCain. The Arizonan's brain cancer is the same diagnosis that Biden's son, Bo, received in 2013, he died two years later. Those conversations set in motion the most dramatic night in modern Senate history. What do you think about this? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section.